Don't let anybody else dictate your life. It sounds very cliche and idealistic, but once you pursue, accept the fact you're a freaking nerd, which I am, and show that to people, you'll find that a lot of more people are accepting of that because they're freaking weird as well. Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity. With your host, Lawrence Neal. This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. HitUni.com are a provider of amazing online courses for high-intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co-author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer and founder of Bay.com, Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer, Simon Shawcross, who's also been a guest on the podcast. Simon has 15 years' experience training clients and is supervisor of a 15 15,000 high-intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high-intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high-intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention there is a DIY course, so this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high-intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regime. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I U-N-I, dot com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW and the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, pick your course and enter the coupon code CW10 for 10% discount. Thank you for your support. This episode is brought to you by Health IQ, a life insurance company that helps health conscious people like runners, cyclists, weightlifters, high intensity training participants, and more get a lower rate on their life insurance. Go to healthiq.com forward slash C warrior to support the show and see if you qualify. If you take care of yourself, you do smart strength training, you eat well, and your life insurance company doesn't seem like they care, there's an answer for you. Health IQ actually gives savings to people who take care of themselves. About 56 percent of health iq customers say between four and 33 percent on their life insurance because of this health iq customers can save up to a third because physically active people have a 56 percent lower risk of heart disease 20 percent lower risk of cancer and 58 percent lower risk of diabetes compared to people that are inactive but your life insurance company probably just doesn't care you care and there are companies out there that care to see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com forward slash C Warrior or mention the promo code C Warrior when you talk to a Health IQ agent. Hey guys, I'm Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the podcast that teaches you how to optimize your high intensity training workouts and start and grow your high intensity training business. My former guests include HIT experts like Dr. Doug McGuff and Drew Bay, diet and metabolism expert Dr. Ted Naiman, paleo pioneers Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf, successful strength training entrepreneurs, time management experts, New York Times bestselling authors and everything in between. Today's guest is Fahad Ahmad. Fahad is the founder of Keto Geek, a very popular producer of low-carb products, including the famous Energy Pod, which the Big Fat Surprise author Nina Teichel said is amazing and she is hooked. Keto Geek has become an ecosystem for high quality products and information on diet and health. And the Keto Geek podcast has featured some very high profile guests like Dr. Sean Baker, Dr. Tim Noakes and Dr. Dominic D'Agostino. This was a super fun conversation. It does take uh, Fahad and I 10 to 15 minutes to warm up. Um, so please be patient because we do get into some very interesting topics. We talk about the ketogenic diet, the carnivore diet, intermittent feasting, the genesis and grand mission of Keto Geek, why sometimes it's smarter to start a service 
strengths-based business before a product business. The importance of building a business is based on strengths and passion, how one tweet from Tim Ferriss made Keto Geek explode, how Keto Geek developed their energy pods, um, how to manage information overwhelm, dogmatism, how to build and promote a successful podcast, and much, much more. And um, There's a few things I just want to cover off quickly. Uh, I just also want to say very interesting to get a macro view on what a podcast has learned from all of their guests. So that's kind of cool hearing, you know, having interviewed all of these interesting people on the Keto Geek podcast for hard has certainly come to some interesting conclusions. Um, I also just want to say I don't want to sound like we're demonizing jobs. Uh, I feel like perhaps both of us come across that way a little bit in this episode. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you enjoy what you do, you're making a positive contribution and you're always growing as a person. It really doesn't matter. And I have no prejudice towards anyone who is an employee versus an entrepreneur. But I do feel like I sound like that a little bit in this episode. So I just wanted to caveat that. Um, another thing to mention is I kind of say that my uh, creation of high intensity training specific content is done and finished, but it really isn't. In fact, since recording this, uh, which was a long time ago, uh, I've actually decided to do the opposite and focus completely on uh, high intensity training and evidence based resistance training in terms of um, how you can improve your own workouts, but also uh, improve your business if you have a business in the area as well. Um, so I just wanted to cover that off because uh, I feel like my opinions have changed a little bit in terms of some of the stuff covered on this particular episode. For all of the show notes and links for this episode and all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org. Don't forget to hang around at the end for your free gift from me. And now I give you founder of Keto Geek, Fahad Ahmad. Fahad, welcome to Corporate Warrior. I appreciate you coming on the show. I feel welcomed. <laughs> awesome. So I'm going to start off with a kind of strange question, but I think it will be a good question to kind of set the scene. So when you go to a party or cocktail party and someone comes up to you and says, Fahad, what do you do? How do you respond to that? Well, I tell them I try to change the world for the better. You That's don't. what I would say, <laughs> just to put it really simple. Um, I try to help humanity. I wake up every single day in the morning, look into the mirror. Well, that sounds a little bit more epic than it actually is. But every morning when I wake up, I think of how can I make this world a better place? What kind of value can I add to the lives of other human beings? How many problems can I solve? That's what I do. Yeah, but... Do you actually say that genuinely? No, I don't. <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> I just uh, I just have to think about it. It's it's that same motto every time. It's it's on repeat. It's in it's just hardwired into my brain. Yeah, yeah. So what's the what's the normal answer, typical answer you give when someone asks? Well, you? the boring answer is boring I answer. <laughs> Yeah, the boring answer is that I started Keto Geek. I try to create as much trouble as I can in the world while trying to create less trouble at the same time. Um, and uh, yeah, so that would be my answer. I started Keto Geek. I began this journey to end the chronic conditions in the world. Uh, when I heard about the keto diet on Tim Ferriss's podcast, and he had Dr. Dominic Diagostino on there, I just saw this pattern that there's this one silver bullet that could potentially help solve a lot of the problems in the world. And I just went into this rabbit hole, decided to do tons of research, figure out what's going on. And then I came on to starting my own business because I went to, onto a ketogenic diet and I realized there aren't many products out there that cater to this lifestyle. And even if the products were there, they just were loaded with foods and sweeteners and all that kind of garbage that I didn't want in my own food. Mm -hmm. So I created these products and started Keto Geek. But then we realized, okay, there's a bit of a problem here. Um, Food companies are limited by media. They are limited by writers. And writers are limited themselves by editors, by everybody else. So I noticed, started noticing this pattern that in order to bring a change in, in this world, you have to create something big. You have to create an ecosystem that contains everything, all the way from write-ups, blogs, products, podcasts, everything. 
So that's exactly what I do when it comes to Keto Geek. In other words, think of that movie that came out about a few years ago called Pacific Rim. There's a line in that. It says, <laughs> in order to kill monsters, we created monsters. So in order to take down titans, we created a titan. That's the goal. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. And then um, now I love what you've done with Keto Geek. I also quite like, I quite the, sim I like the simplicity of it. In fact, that you, you, it would seem like you have basically a single product with some variations and then you created this, um, great media content around it to, to educate your, your audience and, uh, and also at the same time kind of promote some of those things, which is, which is quite clever. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about your, your business background, um, which is quite, quite interesting. So, Keto Geek is not your first business, is it? So do you want to talk, talk, talk to us about your, you know, your, your start, your kind of um, journey into being an entrepreneur? I think you have to love chaos to some extent. It sounds dark, but I think that there's some truth to it. You can't just be observing all the time. You need to have that driving personality. And I saw that in me as soon as I entered college. When I was in Purdue, I was a sophomore attending seniors class and they were working on a fully autonomous electric car. And I think my, the instructor of that class said, hey, you need to get into entrepreneurship. You're way too ambitious for this class. So that was my initial spark. And ever since that point, I've never enjoyed working under someone. I've had a bit of an ego and people demonize ego. I accept the fact it's part of human society. We should embrace it. Everybody's got ego. If they don't, I think they're lying. <laughs> but I think that was the spark. And then I started my car business when my father passed away and I had to take care of my mother. And at that time, I had about a semester or so left for my college degree. And then circumstances pushed me into it because you cannot get a full time job that pays for two people when you don't have a college degree. Even if you do have a college degree nowadays, it's kind of really tough. So I decided to burn the bridges and decided to take a bigger risk. That's when I started my car detailing business. Now, here's the thing for all the business minded people. When you start off from scratch, it's very difficult to start a business which is product based because you need a lot of capital. You need a lot of time. There's tough challenges. So I started off with a service based business. That was the goal so that I generate revenue, support my family, support myself, and then eventually jump into a product-based business and then get into the world of tech, which, spoiler alert, is going to be my future, by the way. So that began my excursion when it comes to working on cars. My Most of my work is would be, and it still is, I still work on cars once in a while. It's a good relaxing activity. But yeah, working on newer cars, putting coatings, films, and those kind of things on there, that gave me enough money to start supplementing Keto Geek when I started it. So one business is now pushing the other business. And I think once you get into the rut of uh, um, entrepreneurship, you're never going to stop. Once you start realizing that you have control over your life and you're getting results, you really don't give an F about anybody else and you just keep plowing forward and that's the addiction i've fallen into yeah i know exactly what you mean it's that you know take responsibility for yourself and not be reliant on anyone or anything else is is quite appealing and um yeah it's certainly it, it, I, can, I can see how even when you know when i've been through some challenging times as an entrepreneur it's like well I'm not going back there. So I'm going to crack on, you know? Um, so that, 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 yeah, that motivation is there. Um, very different businesses, which is very interesting. So you went, you know, the, the, I think the first company there was called Robust Auto Detailing, isn't it? Um, yeah. And then, and then obviously into, into Keto Geek. So remarkably different kind of niches. Um, were you quite passionate about cars when you were, you know, when you were younger then? Is that kind of how that began? Like what, what, what made you start a, a business in that kind of service space? Well, I used to play Need for Speed, a video game back in the good old days. But if I were to be totally honest, it goes back to where we started off in the beginning. When my father passed away, I had to create a change in who I was. At that time, I was a careless kid. I did not care about the environment, the people. I would play video games. So 
I was not a good person as far as productivity is concerned. But taking care of my own mother when she has osteoporosis and several diseases, that kicked me in the balls. And I decided, okay, I need to fix myself in life and take charge. So, yes, it is definitely a very different business. But I think the driving factor is I want to change the world and it's going to be a step by step business, step by step goal accomplishment rather than one giant leap with literally no money in my pocket. So I enjoy cars. I definitely do. And I think you have to find positivity or some motivation in whatever you do, whether it's baking, whether it's cooking or rock climbing. It, I think it's just that kind of personality that you develop as an entrepreneur where you start enjoying everything that you do because you're wearing so many different hats. You're getting exposed so, to so many different kinds of knowledge bases as an entrepreneur. You're never going to be bored. And one of the things that people who have jobs complain about is, oh, look, I'm doing the same thing all over, over and again, and I'm totally burnt out. But when you're an entrepreneur, yes, it's going to be a struggle, but it's going to be worth it. Because once I look back at myself about five years ago, I still remember the days when I would sleep on the carpet and there's these roaches just walking all over the place. <laughs> and I loved those days because those were the times I had a wonderful bonding time with my mother because we were facing a challenge. We were having fun at it. And once you face those struggle struggles and overcome them, the confidence building is huge. And anybody who started from scratch can realize that. So, yeah. I just developed that interest in cars, the beauty of how they look, the fact that they encapsulate evolution and science, and it's just an art form of its own. And this is where I transcend away from the rational brain into the more emotional side, the art. Mm, interesting. So, okay, so you've mo you moved on to, to obviously focusing on keto geek do you still um run that other business as well in tandem yes i still work on the car business and i will not let it go i don't want to get into keto geek 365 days a year mm -hmm. i want to diversify my portfolio of businesses and some people might say oh you need to focus on your startup but i think there's a bigger thing that needs to be painted here do you want to have a good time in life do you want to diversify your experiences or do you want to gain monetary success for me it, it's not about the monetary success to a large extent i want to lead a healthy fulfilling life where i can add value to the lives of people create a change and i think of money as a secondary byproduct of that another thing is that once you're working really hard on one of your businesses you need a break and some of the greatest people or greatest minds i've met in the tech industry. They just love to work in their boring 1992 trucks that are antiquated, but they love them because it gives them that raw experience. They love gardening. They love doing these physical activities that are way off from their tech world. So based on observation and my own experience, it's very important to make sure that you're not just stuck in one sort of mindset. Plus, once you diversify your portfolio, you start seeing these interesting connections that start happening, these sparks of knowledge that you start acquiring. One of the best things I do during these long, grindy days at my car, I can spend, by the way, I can spend about eight to 10 hours just working on a car. But what do I do? I just listen to a beautiful podcast. I would listen to... um an audiobook on Audible, and then just zone out. And some of the best ideas I've, re I've received for Keto Geek have been through uh, those times. So I would recommend people, or at least I would recommend people, not to just get stuck in one thing. Enjoy life. Ideas will come. Money will come. And then ask yourself, what's your goal? Yeah, I, I really resonates with me. I, it, certainly my, my mindset towards business and money and fulfillment and all of that and purpose have really evolved over like the last, 
yeah, obviously constantly evolving, but evolved quite a lot over the last sort of six to 12 months. Um, I was having a conversation with someone yesterday and they were telling me, you know, they're a, they're a young person who are looking to become an entrepreneur of some kind. Um, and he said, you know, a friend of his made 90 K in six months on, on a Shopify selling, you know, whatever. Um, and he said to this guy, Oh, I can show you how to, you know, do the same thing and I can literally walk you through it. And, you know, you can make a load of money. And, uh, my friend was like, well, Okay, let's do that. And he started it and he was like, this is totally not what I want to do. I, I almost couldn't care less about the prospect of earning tons of money. I would rather focus on what I love doing and focus on my passions. Uh, and it sounds like a little bit corny and a lot of people won't take that very seriously. But I honestly believe if you want, and I don't know, uh, you would probably agree with this for hard. Like if you want long term success or, and you want to be consistent and sustain it, you need to have something that is very in line with your own passions and ideally your strengths as well um and then the money will follow like if that's podcasting if that's blogging if that's creating a product or a service you know or something else like the money is a byproduct of whatever path aligns of your own passion would you say that's yeah. that's kind of in alignment with what you're saying yes and at the same time i think money still is very important don't get me wrong on that <laughs> Um, I think you have to pay your family, your girlfriend, everything. I mean, yeah, it's really tr critical. That's exactly why I started the service space business in the first place, because I wanted money. That was the main goal. And I developed interest in cars as a secondary effect of that. And that's just truthful. Um, so it just grew over time. However, there's one thing that I would say that we did very different from other businesses when we started Keto Geek. Instead of pursuing influencers who had 100,000, 200,000 followers on Instagram and marketing the hell out of our Keto Geek products, we surrounded ourselves with people who were educators because we wanted to, I got into Keto Geek because I wanted to end problems. I wanted to solve problems. I want to make my life easier. So I took the hit financially, but I acquired so much knowledge that I think I am very well calibrated and know what I'm talking about a lot of the times. Um, of course, I'm wrong. But at the same time, <laughs> now we're not stuck in a dogmatic thinking because we're fully self-autonomous. We can call the shots on other sort of businesses. For example, we are noticing other food businesses that are just coming up with junk products that really do not that are using keto or low carb or one of these new buzzwords. And once you dug, dig deep into them, a lot of these products are just, a lot of them are like for fat bombs that cause harm. People that are gaining weight on keto and there's bad messaging out there. But since we surrounded ourselves with educators, we have a solid knowledge base and we need know quite a lot more than just being a simple food company. So sometimes you just have to make compromises. How did Keto Geek start? Can you walk us through like the very first days, like the planning, investment, all of that? There wasn't any investment except maybe $2,000. That's about it, tops. Um, the goal was to start as a bootstrap business. Um, as far as the website is concerned, I think you can get a website up and running for 12 bucks. I think that's what I did initially. Uh, people complain about, oh, I need a $500 website. No, you don't. You, you can get your website up running for practically free. Uh, just borrow some bucks from your family or your friends. Um, and we kept everything really simple. Um, a lot of the people who gave us feedback were friends and family. When we created our products, we gave them to a bunch of yoga chicks, really snobby, as snobby as we can find, so that they gave us the most critical approach, which, is, which was fantastic because when we brought our products out to the real world, a lot of people seemed to love them. So we got the worst customers to test our product. Um, besides that, uh, it was really a an interesting grind. We didn't go boom like most companies. We went the organic growth pathway. And as soon as we got our first article published in the local newspaper, Tim Ferriss picked it up. <laughs> Three hours later, he tweets the uh, tweets the 
article on our newspaper and our newsletter list just starts signing up like crazy we get sold out at that time i was like a one person show and i had to work literally two months to fulfill those orders that mr ferris and all this traffic brought me (laughs) so i probably lost a few customers during that process because they were waiting for their orders um and then Immediately, I had to start working on the podcast, working on some write-ups, developing websites. So I was just swarmed. Once again, creating an ecosystem is tough. It's a very different sort of business model that we've adapted. So, but it was a good challenge. We've stabilized now, and uh, our crew has somewhat grown by now. How big's your team? We're about two to three people. That's it cool. right now. We're not exactly like seven, ten people yet. Um, for production, we bring some help in, but we try to make sure – here's our goal. Our goal is to automate everything. And uh, people I, – I would imagine a lot of the people that are listening to your podcast are all about efficiency. So our goal with Keto Geek is to streamline the production to the point where – in production, you require a tops of two or three people, and that's about it. And that's something we've noticed in our keto, in, in the food industries, that there's so many darn freaking middlemen involved <laughs> that are keeping you in check. Oh, you must be vegan. You must be organic. You must be this or that. And we just gave them a middle finger and walked out from that. We said, okay, we're going to call the shots. Not you. We will do it. <laughs> So how did you, I mean, it's just fascinating because it's no, it doesn't seem like a very easy thing to do to, especially a food based business. I mean, how did you come up with the the recipe and, and then obviously, you know, start creating the, the products? Most food companies begin their journey with recipes. We began our journey with science. We converged from science to ingredients to recipes. At the same time, we had some of the great educators that have shown on our podcast tell us, okay, this might be good or this might not be bad. A great example would be collagen protein and uh, a lot of people nowadays seem to enjoy that or put that in their tea or coffee or use it as a supplement but a lot of the educators that we talk to they explain to us that it's practically irrelevant if you're on a ketogenic diet or you're on a carnivorous diet of some sort that's right and then we went with instead whey protein and egg protein and we went with egg protein because a lot of people had allergies to whey or lactose or dairy in general so we listened and had this back and forth conversation with our customers these educators and we tried to go for a product that would last a while and seem to work and go beyond just the buzzwords so that's why we created energy pods rather than just another keto food product it needs to stand and wither the test of time Mm. and and you've got a a notice like you know going on the website you know it's it's clear you've got a very singular focus which i think is a smart strategy as a startup business you know you weren't creating a, a line of products you were just trying to optimize the one product is that part of the part of the plan just to focus on the one product and make that successful Well, it is multifaceted now, at least. Mm. As far as the product is concerned, yes, the focus is now currently on energy pods. We want to build that up. But that's not where the journey stops. Once we start getting in some more revenue, we want Keto Geek to be a creator of tools. You create a tool, send it to the public. Now we work on another tool. So that has been our goal to as far as keto geek is concerned um we want to continue evolving creating new products but yes right now energy pods what do you mean by tools what do you mean creating new tools this could be in the form of maybe apps one of the fun idea we've been thinking about maybe down the road is some sort of a much more younger generation friendly style app that could come in where um it would be more fun and entertaining like an mmo style app where you upgrade your health or those kind of things so we come up with these crazy ideas um so this would be one of the directions where we could go as far as keto geek is concerned then another tool is something that could help the community like a 
uh, an upgraded forum of some sort where people can come in and talk and have a discussion. And then maybe some training classes. That could be another tool where you have instructors or uh, um, practitioners that have a back and forth ex- uh, exchange with their um, with their with customers or with patients, and that could be a subscription-based service. So these various tools would be under the belt of Keto Geek, but Keto Geek still remains as the parent. Understood. Got it. Um, amazing. So one tweet from Mr. Ferris and uh, kind of helped you get get going. Um, <laughs> I always thought even someone like him, um, Twitter's a strange place. And I've heard Tim say before, you know, it's like trying to get exposure on Twitter, even if you have a big audience, is like throwing a golf ball into the Niagara Falls um, and trying to find it. Now, I think that's the expression, although thinking about it now, it doesn't sound quite right. Um, but he, you know, he's got obviously well over a million followers. Um, so I guess purely based on numbers that, that really helped to, um, promote that article and, and resulted obviously in you having a lot of sales, which is pretty cool. Um, you, you know, you've hinted at it before, uh, the start of this podcast. You hinted at it when we spoke last time. You said there's some sort of a, a sea change coming of Keto Geek and a focus on a new product or service in, in the form of something more carnivorous. Do you want to elaborate on that if you can? Or is it top? Oh, side? man. Um, it's, it's sort of under the wraps because we're still working on it. Um, but it is gonna, not going to be pemmican. It's not going to be jerky. It's going to be a lot more hardcore, a lot more raw. Uh, if I were to give a small hint, which I have not given to anybody else, um, think South Africa. <laughs> Maybe some of the people can figure out what I'm talking about. It's, 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 a, ma- it's a mainly South African food item. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. I'm sure some of my listeners might know, but um, no, it sounds uh, sounds interesting. I won't I won't put, press you any further to spill the beans, um, but I can imagine it must be really hard to get anything meaty that's not kind of like jerky. You know, it must be quite challenging in terms of getting it past like regulations and things. Is that <laughs> I'm not I'm not trying to get you to reveal more, but is that is that true? That it's quite difficult to get it through kind of the regulations and things. We'll find a way or make one, I suppose. And I think consumers dictate everything. We'll do what we can. Um, yeah. And hopefully it'll work out. I mean, it is the item we speak of is already in sale. So we don't have any issues as far as regulations. If they can do it, so can we. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very, uh, it's a very entrepreneurial mindset you have there, which is, which is good to see. And now it's time for a quick break. This episode is brought to you by Health IQ, a life insurance company that helps health conscious people like runners, cyclists, weightlifters, high intensity training participants, and more get a lower rate on their life insurance. Go to healthiq.com forward slash C warrior to support the show and see if you qualify. If you take care of yourself, you do smart strength training, you eat well, and your life insurance company doesn't seem like they care, there's an answer for you. Health IQ actually gives savings to people who take care of of themselves. About 56% of Health IQ customers save between 4 and 33% on their life insurance because of this. To see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com forward slash Warrior, or mention a promo code Warrior when you talk to a Health IQ agent. And now back to the show. Wanted to ask you a bit about the podcast, which uh, you know, which which I've I've listened to a few of your episodes and enjoyed that. And obviously, I've been on your podcast and loved being interviewed by you. That was a lot of fun. Um, and I'm just really curious, you know, of all the people you've interviewed, um, what has been the most impactful thing that you've learned through the, doing the podcast? Do you think? And and that's kind of that you've then implemented. We had a podcast with Professor Tim Noakes. And the most important thing that he mentioned was always explore paradox, paradoxes because they can lead to the greatest scientific breakthroughs in history, which is a fact. Galileo, Newton, Einstein, all of these people had that theme in common. And the problem we've started noticing is when people get too much into something, and this is a trip that a lot of scientists, nutritionists, doctors get into too hardcore, too much worrying about that last little piece of protein or carb or fat. So you lose that ability 
to explore paradoxes because you get so entrenched into one way of thinking that you now have to defend the parapets rather than go out there and hunt for knowledge. And we notice that because sometimes I go to some of these people, some of these researchers, and I say, okay, we need to explore this. These are paradoxes. There's 5,000 people who are doing this, or it seems like it. And they ask me the question, what is the evidence? Of course, I don't have the evidence. You're the researcher, not me. So that has been very impactful, and it has shown the true colors of many of the people that I would have respected or or, or should have respected, and I've lost some of that for them. The people that show up on our podcasts, I respect them completely. I know they're doing the right thing. They're good human beings, and they test, they pass through this paradox test that I call it, <laughs> that if somebody's not willing to look at paradoxes, and explore them, there's a big chance they're stuck in a dogmatic way of thinking and they're entrenched in an industry that they cannot get out of. But is that not a fair question for them to ask you where the evidence is? Because that is that is kind of our, our compass for a lot of truth is is looking at the weight of the evidence for all of this different the, all these different dietary recommendations. Um, so is that not a fair question that they would pose back on you? Do you not do you not agree? That- I totally agree with that. This is a perfect question they should ask me is like, where is the evidence? But then again, I'm not making a claim here. What I'm saying is I'm noticing this pattern. And since you're a researcher, you're well versed and more educated than I am. And if there could be certain silver bullets that can counter certain arguments and could solve so many problems of the world, then this is where I need to stop. I cannot go down to the knowledge that some of these people can go down to. Some of these biochemists, they know these things to the nth degree. But I would really appreciate it if some of these people would hunt these evidences and tell me why these paradoxes don't make sense, rather than shut down the case by asking me for the evidence. Um, I openly agree. I don't have the evidence. That's why they're paradoxes. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. It's uh, it's, it's it's a lack of openness and open-mindedness is what you're facing, which uh, which I, I know exactly what you mean, and I've experienced that um, communicating with, with all sorts of experts online and, um, and through the podcast and things like that. Um, Okay, so what uh, you know in terms of what you've learned doing the podcast, like because I'm I'm constantly learning new things from my guests and in tweaking and making small changes in my own life. And there's a lot of times where I don't do that, where I you know I might learn a ton of stuff, but I don't put it all into practice because that would be overwhelming. But I do try and implement some of the stuff that makes the most sense for me. So, is there anything that's happened that you've learned that you've implemented that you want to share? Yes, that you can always go down rabbit holes. And those will come with diminishing returns. You have to put a cap on the amount of knowledge you can acquire. In a sea of information overload, that's one of the biggest challenges that as a podcaster, as someone who's trying to solve a problem that you can get into. And uh, you have only a limited amount of time on Earth. You have a limited time in the day. And uh, some people uh, would think of this as an ignorant way of thinking. But I think that's why specialists exist. That's why you bring guests over so that they can calibrate you, they can guide you, they can help you so that you can maintain that level of abstraction as far as knowledge is concerned. And that's what I've learned, um, basically cap everything and learning that there you need to be somewhat ignorant to some extent. Yeah, for sure. And uh, this whole like, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. <laughs> That's so true. Um, I found like, you know, with my podcast, it's like the more I got really into resistance training and specifically high intensity training, the more I realized, wow, there's so much we don't know. And it, and it became, I became very insecure about that. Um, but reality is, is that, you know, those guys who are the most expert and the most knowledgeable in these areas, they're even more aware of more stuff that we don't know. And um, so they, I can only imagine how they must feel. Um, but yeah, I, 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 it's interesting that you bring this up, this, um, this capping the intake, because I remember Tim talking about, you know, I think someone questioned Tim, like, how do you, um, retain all this information? Like, how do you action everything you take from a podcast? And, uh, he would just say, you know what? The good shit sticks. And I think he learned that from Kyle Fussman or one of those, one of the guys he interviews, you know, which is basically, it's pretty self-explanatory, but it's like, you know, if it really resonates with you, you're going to remember. 
you know, and just have faith <laughs> and not worry about trying to, like you say, it's, the, the information overwhelm, just if you're a normal person who doesn't have a podcast is, is bad enough, let alone, you know, uh, you know, the position we're in where we're like interviewing all these experts, learning all this stuff, and then constantly being challenged on our beliefs, you know, which is a precarious place to be sometimes. Um, what about like the changes you've made to your diet for heart? Have you like changed, like, I'd be interested in knowing like, I, I, I'm assuming it's quite kind of keto, um, kind of design your diet. Could you want to just elaborate on, you know, how, how you eat and, and how perhaps the podcast influenced that at all? Yes. When we started Keto Geek, we wanted to become vegans. We started vegetarians. We wanted to become vegans. <laughs> and the problem is we invited a few carnivores on board because we wanted to know, just like I was mentioning earlier with Tim Noakes telling us to explore paradoxes. We saw this guy who was just shoving things into the air and he's eating meat and water. He's already been on your podcast. People can figure out who I'm talking about. Um, and so that helped us think further, and we started to realize maybe there's a carnivorous way of eating that could solve a lot of problems. And then we explored the science of this way of eating, which is a very carnivorous diet. And then further, we had Dr. Peter Ballerstad, who explained us the sustainability. There's a good argument for that. And then Amber O'Hearn explained to us the science. Recently, we had Zofia Clemens, who's practically pitching an all me diet against some of the complicated cancers which spoiler alert seems to work and kind of dismantles everything that you know about as far as meat and cancer and heart disease is concerned once you put something against the very thing it's known to cause and it doesn't do that then it kind of shows you that okay there's a lot of bad stuff that is being shoved into our face as far as nutritional guidelines are concerned so i've adopted a nutty carnivore sort of diet where i'm open to plants but i have a very carnivorous framework and this is my skepticism towards people who believe in a carnivorous diet is that i think we should keep an eye or our mind open towards plants for their material no benefits for their uh, pleasure benefits. Pleasure is a great reason. Um, humans thrive on that to some extent and for joy and happiness. So, yes, that is how I have transcended. This is where I am at the moment. I'm not closed off to be exploring the vegan side of the world. Um, and But it's kind of tough to find someone in that sort of sphere and uh, at the same time, here's the problem. It's like, I am not a biochemist. I am not a researcher. So for me to put a vegan onto a podcast, I need to counter that with someone else who has an idea about the other side of the spectrum. So yes, diet has evolved. And I feel great, feel amazing. It's been the best. <laughs> so what are you, what are you eating mostly? Meat and vegetables, basically. I go on something called an intermittent feasting sort of thing where I eat steak and eggs, unlimited amount. And when I stop feeling hungry, I stop eating. Um, it automatically leads to caloric restriction and appetite suppression and uh, ends up resulting in a period of intermittent fasting. That's why I call it intermittent feasting because everything just happens automatically. Um, and then when I feel like I want to eat something sweet, I go to one of our energy pods. Chocolate is my favorite. I consume those. And that's about it. We've noticed or anecdotally in our community that our sweet tooths and cravings are reduced. And this boosts your this whole sort of lifestyle boosts your productivity in a way because you're not spending as much time in the kitchen. You're not spending time in the grocery store. You're just going to one place and getting all your food from there. And the energy pods are just like a supplemental fat that you can add to it. A lot of meat is very lean, in my opinion. And uh, some of the fattier meats are way too freaking expensive at the moment. And the price is all, only going to go up from this point onward. So yes, saves time, saves headache. It's a win-win everywhere. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm very familiar with the intermittent feasting. Is that um <laughs> so is that a one meal a day generally or one or two meals? It ends up being about two meals a day. The days that I am really working 14, 16 hours a day, 
then I would probably have one or maybe two meals. But on a normal relaxed day, I'll probably maybe even have three meals a day. Like, you know how people take a smoke break? I take a steak break <laughs> and just go to the grill and just make a steak and just chow it down. That's <laughs> that's my strategy. Nice. Um, and just going back to what you're saying, like, you know, um, I'm actually quite keen to bring uh, – a vegan or vegetarian onto ideally a vegan onto the podcast. Um, now this may be a bit of confirmation bias or cognitive bias from my side, but I struggle to find any of those people to be very likable. I find they're, they're very, I mean, you get this in the paleo community too, so I shouldn't be so hard on those guys, but I, I'm struggling to find someone who's kind of likable slash um, intellectually, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I don't know. Like they're just, I'm just struggling to find someone I'd like to get on the podcast. Dicks. Yeah. Dicks. I don't know. Like <laughs> possibly. I mean, the thing is though, when, what you got to remember though, is like, I think it could be very easy to get kind of stuck in a, a bubble where you're like, you know, your, your whole Twitter feed and Instagram and Facebook uh, is full of like, you know, for me, it's like high intensity training and carnivory and keto and like all this type of stuff. So I never really see a lot of vegan vegetarian stuff because I don't follow all those types of people. However, what do I see? I see those, the people in my own bubble tearing down the others. So it's just further, further, you know, reinforcing my own confirmation bias which i'm very aware of now but i wasn't in the past so perhaps i need to pass you know perhaps it's, it's a reflection of my own ignorance by me standing here saying there's no smart vegans <laughs> and actually i should uh, perhaps yourself as well for hard <laughs> should uh should look a little harder and uh and find the the vegans that actually have some real you know, interesting things to say. Uh, so if you find that person before me, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I, I did a tweet through Keto Geek asking our followers, hey, is there a vegan out there who could come to our podcast? I would be interested in knowing how they're doing their diet, if they have counter arguments, are they fighting cancers or chronic conditions? Maybe we can give people another tool to look at. Crickets. <laughs> That's what happened. Um, but yes, I think there there's always going to be dogmatic thinking going on, no matter what activity you're going to be doing. That's just a part of the human experience. I don't think you can curb stomp that out from us. There's always going to be radical people uh, in belief systems and the way people think, whether it's the scientific community or the religious community or any sort of community. So I think the best we can do is uh, just have a good perspective, um, just to go super controversial over here. Sir, um, there are women that would throw their children on landmines, but they know they're doing the right thing for a specific belief system. So humans have the capacity to be brainwashed and follow down a rabbit hole. And once they do, they will do whatever they can to defend it, especially if their lives depend on that. And you can ex um, interpolate these results into the world of nutrition diet everywhere basically they're going to defend it it's very hard to find unbiased people because unbiased people are freaking boring um because they have no controversy they have no drama they are just normal people I don't think we they hate exist. them <laughs> i just don't think they but, exist you know i asked sean baker who you're referring to earlier me and walter um you know how do you how do you not be biased and he was like oh, i am <laughs> it's like you can't not be like it's very difficult it's like a just a default condition yeah and you know what you I'm, I'm starting to notice these this this church of unbiasedness it's starting to happen now where people are going into the oh i am so unbiased that i'm never going to take a stand and i'm going to shut down so this is what starts happening you have one person who goes on a ketogenic diet now they become a bit of a zealot oh every other diet is just an it's just not going to work. It's a failure. And then they go into an understanding period where they're like, okay, there's other options. I need to chill out a little bit. And then, then they go to this super elite level where they think, okay, I need to go into the church of unbiasedness and make sure that uh, we 
tell everybody that keto isn't the only thing. I'm going to be so unbiased and holy that. Uh, um, so, yeah, this just gets into this madness. Humans are weird, man. That's really interesting, actually, because I, I kind of agree with you. Like, I, I yeah, I, it's like I want to be unbiased, but at the same time, it's. It's more fun to be biased sometimes. <laughs> of know. course it is. <laughs> yeah, um, trolling is the most fun activity in the world. But not very. That- but perhaps not that productive. I don't know. Um, no, it's not. But but also, I quite like. Um, Who's it? Mark Andreessen, who said, and I've had a, I've had a few people reiterate this since. Is the the um, the kind of operating system where you have strong beliefs loosely held. So you have a strong belief and then as soon as someone presents you with evidence to the contrary, and that's good evidence, that you are prepared to then suspend that opinion and change it on a dime. I quite like Mm. that as like a way of being, but Jesus, um, not quite there yet myself, I don't think. So... Sorry, go on. I think that, yeah. yeah, the challenge there would be is, like I said, is you won't get attention. Look at the reality shows. They get the most amount of listening because it's the drama. Humans are driven and conditioned by their emotional gratification. We haven't transcended beyond the point where rationality is going to take over the emotional part yet. It's work in progress. How do you think? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> I said, oh, is that what you think? That's fascinating. Yeah, that's what I think is that we are still encapsulated with the way of thinking it as far as um, the world of emotional gratification. Um, we still love junk food, for example, in the world of food and nutrition. So that's why it's going to take us some time to actually break through that shell and become more rational. Who knows? We might not never we might never be able to do that. Yeah, it's interesting because it gets very complicated and my brain is starting to hurt me a little bit. Um, <laughs> so just, uh, just want to talk a little bit more about your podcast, which is, um, which is, which is growing steadily, I've noticed. And, um, just curious, you know, what was for you, what was the kind of main driver and purpose of doing the podcast? Fixing problems. Go to the heart of the problem, find out the solution efficiently, quickly, fast, and just get, get results. Um, that was the main driving goal. I don't care who came onto the podcast. I needed to see some results. I needed to see something that made sense and uh, something that could potentially help people. And that's been the motivation. That's been the mindset. Um, we, I, I don't care if anybody speaks Chinese, German, whatever, broken English, or their whatever their color, skin, whatever they are. What matters is what kind of value are they adding to, to the world? And how are they replicating paradoxes? And if if they're able to do that successfully, they're coming on. So does that mean that you will have people outside of the uh, the dietary sphere? Because I know it's mostly diet, um, aside from myself. Um, but you're quite open to kind of bringing on all sorts of people, are you, outside of that? Yeah, I think we're going to open the floodgates on different topics now because we've kind of overkilled the hell out of food and nutrition. And personally, I don't want to spend too much time on food and nutrition and diminishing returns, like the 80-20 rule. Mm-hmm. It's like you're, you've, the, you don't get that much results after a certain point. And we're starting to feel that burn here as far as food and nutrition is concerned. Okay, we've dealt with cancer. We've dealt with cholesterol. We've dealt with every single thing. Now it's time. Let's focus on maybe something outside of it, like psychological disorders or how neuroscience works or maybe, I don't know, get into politics. Who knows? That's cool. I have totally overdone it to probably an even greater extent with high-intensity strength training. My God, Um, I must have done like close to probably 50 60 episodes focused on that and you know it's it's i think it's safe to say that it's pretty much been done uh and it's time to move on <laughs> to to some even some tangential topics like you were just saying or some new some new stuff um doesn't not to say i won't ever for those listening or ever you know post more uh high intensity training blogs or podcasts in the future but i do think that there needs to be some fresh different stuff like this one for instance. Um, yeah. And okay, so with the podcast, you know, how are you, how are you actually, what's the, what's the kind of goal with that? And how are you growing over time? 
Well, we are growing pretty steadily as far as our podcast is concerned. The main goal is very selfish, to educate myself and our community mainly. So that's been the goal. Now, if it has the side effect of helping other people, that's great. But uh, mostly it's our tribe and then uh, helping those people. That's the highest priority. Um, So that would be it as far as the podcast is concerned. Uh, we don't know exactly what direction we're going to go next, but we definitely need to get out of this shell of nutrition. What do you do? What do you do to promote it? So every time you do a new episode, I'm going to steal your steal your tips now. Um, you know, whenever you do a new episode, how do you promote it out there into the uh, into the world? We have a big web of social media presence where we have a Facebook page, Facebook group, Instagram account. We have Twitter follower followers. And then now we have an active YouTube channel now as well. So cross promoting across the platforms that works out great. And then people seem to pick up on good material, good content. So organic growth is also very uh, influential as far as the podcast growth is concerned. Um, And then, of course, Facebook groups can be good. Initially, I used to do that, but now I'm just focused on just plowing forward rather than promoting too much, which is a bad idea. Marketing is really important. Um, But then again, if you have good people on your side, they do promote your podcast themselves. Uh, For example, if you bring on a good guest that potentially helps change the life of some other person they'll post it on their instagram or their twitter or they'll come to the call themselves i think that's important as far as the growth of the podcast is concerned let your followers do everything yeah and i i I bow with this quite a lot actually because um i agree with you if your work is of high quality then your your followers and your listeners will share that with other people um so if you listen to this now if you share this i really appreciate it <laughs> but um i i sometimes think is it enough to rely on that alone you know to to just if that's the focus then all, all your focus becomes is very very high quality content as consistently as possible um and then then there's like a snowball effect, you know, more people share it with more people and so on. Um, and I, I did actually take the foot off the gas quite a lot last year in regard to marketing. And, um, this year I am far, I'm kind of trying to do both things. I'm trying to create consistent high quality content, but also do what I think are the best marketing things. And for me, I don't know if you've, well, you actually mentioned this just now. Facebook groups does actually work really well, like sharing the episode in the group. So long as the group is relevant to the group, obviously. And so long as you've got a good relationship with the admin, <laughs> I find that spamming Facebook groups might not be the best idea. Is that what yeah. you've noticed? Yeah, I don't do that anymore. Mm. And I think there needs to be a big, very big cultural shift now where if you start noticing how net neutrality and some of these things that are going around, the signs are there. People need to start stepping up to help their content producers. If they want to support Lawrence Neal, they need to somehow get into their Patreon. If they want to support an educator, That needs to start happening ASAP. The old apprentice-student relationship, this is the style that needs to start building up. Most of the people that start their podcasts don't make that much money. So I think it's really important to for new podcasters to have some sort of a calling or a mission where they're trying to do something for people, add value to the lives of people. But there needs to be a monetary aspect here. You cannot have a podcast without any sort of um, money involved. That's a that's a tough cookie. And I know I understand what Tim Ferriss says over here. Uh, but at the same time, there's so much information out there, so much, that certain feathers need to be ruffled, especially with our younger generation, which has an attention span of a teaspoon. We need to... Um, I think maybe podcasters need to start putting some more... Um, bite-sized portion, portion, uh, bite-sized uh, sound bites, or 
material Short on their episodes. social medias. Yeah, that kind of stuff would really help and gravitate people towards the podcast. And I've also noticed it's pretty tough getting iTunes reviews. So guys and gals listening to this podcast, please leave an iTunes review for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd appreciate that. Um, yeah, it is. It's interesting. Like uh, with reviews, I've noticed the most effective way to do it is to ask people directly, you know, like one on one direct response. Like if someone emails me and I see now are uh, normally thank, uh, respond and, uh, you know, express my appreciation, but then also say, you know, if you've got a second, please go and leave a review on iTunes, but iTunes don't make it easy, which is really irritating. Firstly, you have to have a, on desk, on laptop, you have to have a, um, what's it, an iTunes account, don't you? Or an Apple, uh, yeah, iTunes app. So if you haven't got that, you can't leave it anyway. So anyone who's on like PC or Android is going to kind of struggle, which is a bit irritating. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's uh, all just Facebook chat, you know, direct response type, you know, uh, DMing seems to be quite effective. But yeah, doing like I did a Facebook post the other day and I asked for reviews at the end and I, I think I had one, you know, and that went out to probably that probably hundreds saw that. You know, it's just the effort. And like you say, people are so overwhelmed with inputs, with data information that they they don't, they're just like, oh, I can't bother to do that because I'm going to go and scroll down and watch this video about cats instead, you know? <laughs> yeah. So that's and, what we're fighting against. Yeah. And just to paint a bit of a bit bigger picture here, we touched on a little bit before. Hmm. The challenge of the modern world isn't the knowledge or the ability to acquire knowledge. It's the ability to find good knowledge that works and filter out irrelevant knowledge i think that's the new power not knowledge is power that's bad messaging and then we you have to realize as consumers and listeners that you guys will get what you ask for and this is cold hard truth here we asked for processed foods that would save us time at a reduced cost and we wanted those and guess what we got those but everything comes with a side effect and it did come with a side effect so if we empower our educators and really support them, go out of our way to do it, and it takes just a few seconds, that would create a strong bond and a community that would truly help change the world. We have to show some empathy towards these people that are really adding value to our lives. And to be honest, some of these educators that we come across on our podcast, they save thousands and thousands of dollars in Medicare costs, prevention of diseases that could potentially happen. They're giving it away for free. So there needs to be a reciproc reciprocatory relationship here. Oh, that's a good word. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I agree with what you're saying completely. Um, Fahad, I'm going to ask you some kind of more rapid fire ish questions, but the, you know, the, the answers don't have to be rapid fire. Um, what is the first, I mean, you're, you're, this is the thing, you're, you're pretty in, into efficiency. You know, you, you talked before about how you, um, you don't like to cook and hence why the energy pod is ideal for someone like you. Um, but what does the first kind of 90 minutes of your day look like? Do you have any kind of morning routines or things like that? Yes, I wake up in the morning, uh, take a shower, cold or hot, uh, cold if I'm going to the gym, hot if I'm going to the yoga, and then I go do Ashtanga yoga in the morning, or I go to the gym, uh, two to three days of Ashtanga yoga, and then three to four days of weight training, and maybe squeezing a rest day, and that'll be my first 90 days in the morning. You mean 90 minutes, not 90 days. <laughs> <sighs> 90 minutes. Damn it. <laughs> I'm losing it, man. Okay, so pretty much straight into the shower, straight into that. I suppose there's no breakfast, is there? So that's not in. What about coffee? Are you a coffee guy? Pre workout. All uh, right. Just pre workout. It has caffeine, 300 milligrams. Oh, is this, uh, oh, is this like a supplement, like a, like a pill or? Um, it's a pre-workout powder that I just oh. put into a shaker bottle and add some water to it. And then I'll add some MCT oil and 10 grams of dextrose to it. It's just a regimented thing. It's not necessary, especially if you're new to any sort of a diet, but it's just a, it's a vice. Ah, fair enough. Okay. So what is one of your favorite personal failures, especially or specifically, sorry, a failure that led in some way to a success further down the road for you? My death of my father, I think that's a failure that was outside of my control. 
but it sparked the biggest change in my life. And uh, when all the people leave away from your life and you're left alone, that's when you start picking up the pieces together mm. and you know it gets dark. But once you get through that, that's the most powerful force you've created within you. Yeah. How, how long ago was that, if you don't mind me asking? That was about four years or so ago. Man, time fa passes fast. I lose track of that stuff. I mean, I, I know it's important, but these business days are long, man. Yeah, <laughs> 16 no, hours. My, yeah, my, no, my mum passed away 2015. Um, so I know what you mean. Like there are... There are some days or weeks where I might not even think about her, which is like people are going to hear that thing. Oh, that's terrible. But it's, it's like if you're really focused on something and you're passionate about something, it's easy to just get swept away and just be completely focused on that. And then obviously there are, you know, many, many days and weeks where I think about her a lot. But um, but yeah, so I just wanted to add to, to your point on that. Um what have you what have you changed your your mind about in the last year with regard to i guess diet and um well no actually i'm not going to leave it open what have you changed your mind about in the last year that the first thing that sort of comes to mind always accept who you are don't let anybody else dictate your life it sounds very cliche and idealistic but once you pursue accept the fact you're a freaking nerd which i am and show that to people, you'll find that a lot more people are accepting of that because they're freaking weird as well. So just enjoy yourself and people will follow. <laughs> How old are you, Fahad, if you don't mind me asking? 29. 29? Sorry, say 29, did you? Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm a year older than you. Um, so that's interesting. It's hard to, hard to say, hard to uh, uh, pinpoint your age just by sort of looking at you and even listening to you. Um, but yeah, I, I really, that really resonates with me because I feel exactly the same way. I feel like, um, the older I get, the just the less I care about what anyone else thinks. And that, that kind of gets a little bit better each year. I think eventually I'm going to turn into a really nasty person. Hopefully not, but, um, yeah, you've got to be careful with stuff like that. Um, yeah. What's the, the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Well, it goes back to the same one. Always chase paradoxes. If something's repeating itself and it's happening, it's controversial, it creates a change, explore it. Don't ignore it. As a generalist, you have the biggest strength in the world to do those kind of things. You have the freedom. I think that's powerful. Do you know, big, uh, just to elaborate on, because I think some people might hear that and think, oh, what does he mean when he says paradox? Could you say that, like, a good example would be this whole uh, zero carb craze, right? This kind of carnivory, where there's all these examples and anecdotes of people that are looking in great health from moving to a, an all meat diet. Um, is that a good example, do you think, of one of these paradoxes where meat's been, you know, flagged as being obviously bad for you for such a long time? Yes, and at the same time, veganism is also a somewhat of a paradox. You guys are crazy, but it seems to work somewhat. <laughs> That's true, but why is that? Because it cuts out all the crap, right? <laughs> <laughs> no idea. I haven't gone into that rabbit hole yet. Uh, it's uh, it's funny because, in my opinion, it's like they both they both work. I mean, paleo or vegan, if you want to try and capture a, them in two two headings, um, and but they 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 work, I suppose. Um, I guess there is a lot of inter, inter individual variability, but they work because they're cutting out a lot of the crap, a lot of the processed refined carbohydrate and the sugary stuff and the junk food. Um, because if you're not eating that, then you're eating whole food practically. So it's, oh, I'm not, I'm teaching you to suck eggs now for hard, but, um, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, that, you know, that's, that's some important thing to, to think about when you're comparing these diets, I think for, for the listeners. Um, which book have you gifted or recommended the most? I have a very abusive relationship with books. I think they are, they can be very redundant and they can trap the writers or educators in dogmatic thinking because once you write it, it's a set it and forget it sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's my gripe with books. But at the same time, they really encapsulate knowledge really well from the past and can be very, a very valuable asset. I had to add that, by the way. For oh, food and nutrition, fun. why? 
yeah, for food and nutrition, Wired to Eat is great. For a general philosophical starting basic book, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind is great. Uh, something that's a lot more, a little bit more controversial, Greatest Show on Earth by Richard Dawkins is good. If you're looking for somewhat of a narrative, and I think narratives are important because they inspire scientists and science, The Open Boat by Stephen Crane is a fantastic book. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. No, I, I recognize some of those names and yet to pick up and read why to eat. And that's been recommended to me a number of times. Now. That's Rob Wolf's book, isn't it? Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. And what is the best way for people to find out more about you for hard and what you're up to? They can find us at ketogeek.com. They can follow us on Twitter at ketogeek.com. They can find us on Instagram at keto underscore geek. And we're also on YouTube, which is a growing channel. They can find out our products at ketogeek.com as well. Um, the most, the best way is to go to ketogeek.com slash sign up and get to the newsletter where we condense every single darn thing and put that in there. That is the best. Awesome. And, uh, Everyone listening, I do encourage you to check out Keto Geek, check out the podcast, buy yourself an energy pod and let me know what you think. Uh, they're looking, ri- the chocolate ones look dead tasty, I must say. Um, and I was definitely thinking about purchasing some, but I'm assuming there's like a, some sort of shipping cost, which is a problem with, uh, living in Ireland and wanting to, you know, try some of these, uh, all these goods out in the US, you know? Um, but, uh, but yeah, is, is that the case? Is there like a, I guess a shipping cost for international orders and that type of thing? Customs, man. Yeah. Those guys are killers. <laughs> it's gotta be, it's gotta be done. Yeah, you, you gotta, at the end of the day, you've gotta, you've gotta obviously, uh, price that accordingly to make a profit. So I completely appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I encourage everyone to check that out and to find the, the blog post for this episode. Um, go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash keto geek <laughs> and to find a full list of all episodes, go to corporatewarrior.org and you'll see this one along with the rest of the hundred and something rather episodes. And until next time, guys, thank you very much for listening i hope you enjoyed that episode before you head off head on over to corpwarrior.com that's c-o-r-p warrior.com to get your free high intensity training google progress chart and ebook with six interview transcripts with some of my top guests including dr doug mcguff drew bay and bill de simone on how to optimize muscle gain fat loss and overall health in an efficient effective and sustainable way These transcripts are deliberately not verbatim. Instead, they've been transcribed in an easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to quickly pick out what you need and start getting results. To get your ebook, head on over to corpwarrior.com, enter your email address, then check your email for an email from me with a confirmation link. Once you click the link, you will be instantly redirected to a PDF version of the transcripts. This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. HitUni.com are a provider of amazing online courses for high-intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co-author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer and founder of Bay.com, Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer, Simon Shawcross, who's also been a guest on the podcast. Simon has 15 years' experience training clients and is supervisor of a 15 15,000 high intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention there is a DIY course, so this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regime. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount, discount on any course you purchase simply head on over to hituni.com that's h-i-t-uni u-n-i.com and enter the coupon code cw10 that's cw and the number 10 so again head on over to hituni.com pick your course and enter the coupon code cw10 for 10 percent discount thank you for your support <laughs>